The seventh generation was taking the sim racing genre to a whole new dimension with what the hardware can do, but early in its life cycle there was a minor drought. Polyphony Digital was still developing Gran Turismo 5, nobody had the F1 license for two seasons, some were still trying to get to grips with the new hardware, etc. And the first time I even got a racer for the PS3, Xbox 360 was at the turn of the decade. But there was one clear outlier, Microsoft, who capitalized with the Forza series with the second one selling around 4 million copies and were already on pace to make another sequel. Unveiled at E3 in 2009, Dan announced it was going to have more cars, tracks, customization options, an interior view, you can rewind the clock, basically better everything on and offline. Quite a feat for a game that would take only two years to develop. Forza Motorsport 3 was released in October 2009, and I think you get it by now, it's the first time I'm playing this, blah blah blah. However, disclaimer, the second disc hasn't been installed for this review because, long story short, it thinks it's lived in a lion cage before I bought it, even though it doesn't look like it, and I tried so many different ways to install the extra content to no prevail. I'll let it slide for now because this isn't the first time I've had to deal with technical shenanigans and still get the full review nonetheless, and the rest of the game is fabulous. It just means you won't see footage of point-to-point -point events or Le Mans races, that's about it. This one tries to change things up a bit by adding a season play. The routine is still the same. You start off with a slow car, win races to earn money, and buy faster ones in more demanding events. It's still Forza Motorsport I know from the predecessors. But the way you approach it has been closed up like a racing career mode. You race in a season structured by a calendar, and each one has a class championship to compete in. But between rounds, you choose a single race event to fill up the spaces, which randomize every time. And once you complete the championship, presuming you win it, you went to the next season with higher classified events to compete in. I was initially worried about this setup because you don't get any proper information like typical opponents or circuit list before you can even select it, all you get is the class restriction. And once you select it, you have to respect the schedule. But what if I want to go back to the events I skipped? Ah, well, if you select the event list, you can do just that. What I really like about this setup, once you understand how it works, is that it tries a different structure, trying to emulate what it's like to pursue a racing career, and win prize cars faster without realizing it, while still technically keeping the original one if you prefer to try out different event types, although you do get Xbox achievements for sticking with the season play. A couple of different event types have either remained or returned, like the point-to-point -point races for example. But what's interesting is that Oval Track Racing has its own set of events, and another makes its introduction to the series. Drag Racing, which I didn't find all that exciting honestly, because you can race with an automatic transmission, so all you do is hold the accelerator, which means it's all about the level of revs you're on when taking off. But that's the worst thing you could say about this game, which gives you a clear idea of how good it is. There are way more circuits this time round, and they've improved their creativity with the fictional ones, like here. It's like driving through a desert Euro Speedway. This one is like a mini version of the advanced circuit in Daytona USA, and this must be where Polyphony got their inspiration for one of their tracks in Gran Turismo 6. On top of that, every single circuit that was in Forza Motorsport 2, real and fictional including the DLC ones, are here along with Catalunya and Suki de la Sa. So what you get in Forza Motorsport 3 are the same tracks as the second FM and more, presumably to reduce the workload of the developers. Need I remind you that it took less time for Turn 10 to develop these two than it took Polyphony to develop Gran Turismo 5, nor have less content than the predecessor ending up like Forza Motorsport 5 a few years later. It has a great balance of real and fictional circuits, and I love racing on all of them. I really mean it. I don't think we've moved that far ahead in the 8th generation. It'll be interesting to see what the 9th gen has in store. Like I wonder what Forza Motorsport 8 will look like. 
I say that here because it might be because of similar resolutions or how tech evolved in the past, but Forza Motorsport 3 is almost a decade old, and for a video game, it still looks great. It all comes down to the knowledge of the hardware most of the time, because if you look at sequels to video games released on the same console, they typically look better, and Forza Motorsport 3 is no different. If you look closely, particularly at Catalunya or Camino Vejo de Montserrat, the background of the tracks are extremely detailed for an Xbox 360 game that came out a decade ago. I mean, talk about creativity making a racetrack on these Catalan mountains. It'll never happen, but that's why we have video games. Yeah, there's so much effort and detail put into these graphics, I've got nothing to criticize. Maybe the loading times, because they're longer than most games of this type, but there's a good reason for it. And in between, they contain some genuinely interesting historical trivia, even if I know most of it already. And don't get me started on the showroom. When I played racing video games all those years ago, for some reason I got an enjoyment out of looking at the cars and contemplating over how freezing they look before taking them for a spin. And you can tell that the developers felt the same way, because... wow. And the interior isn't just reserved for the showroom, because this is the first Forza title to have a first person view, which back then was awesome. It's not as detailed as Gran Turismo 5 or even Need for Speed Shift, which came around the same time. The car doesn't shake as hard during braking. You don't turn the wheel as much, nor do you even change gear. But this view applies to every single car in this game, even if it's customized, not just 30% like Gran Turismo, which I think is tremendous. It's not trying to reach a 1000 car milestone. It's all about what's fun to drive and, according to Dan, how SUVs behave on a track. Quality over quantity. There are over a hundred cars more than the second game, around 400, which explains why there are two discs required to get the full experience. And nearly every big name manufacturer is here. You're never short on variety in racing games like these. However, remember when I questioned the lack of Aussie cars in Project Gotham Racing in my PGR2 review? Well, this quote is the answer. I agree, it is disappointing. Why couldn't they just change the badges for certain regions as it pertains to the GM models? Chevrolet in North America, Vauxhall in UK, Opel in Europe, and Holden in Australia. At least we have the V8 supercars as a consolation, and I pounced on the chance to buy one when I could. As usual with customization, the first few cars I stylized were about getting the hang of how it worked, which is why my first car looked like a rally racer, or if it's going for a crash test. Then spent the first couple of hours painting the cars using recycled spray cans from the garage you need for speed carbon. What I noticed here is that you can even fine tune pearlescent paint jobs, cyan and purple, something that even TVR haven't done yet, to my knowledge. The only drawback I have with painting your car is not being able to change the secondary color, like the strong stripes on a Ford GT or Mustang? What if I want a purple one with orange stripes? Or black with red stripes? Well, you have to do it manually. After the Formula 1 came to Australia, and the motorsport in the back of my mind all the time, all my custom jobs will be based off F1 cars from the past. They're a bit rough around the edges, but I'm super proud of these. Again, you get thousands of layers and hundreds of different vinyls and decals to choose from. So if you're a creative person, you could spend hours on this part, like I did. And because Auction House returns from the second game, you could put your works up for auction, earn some money in the process, or if you simply want to show off what you got while racing online, you can do that too. Other things you can do online via storefront include paint jobs, logos, and setup files, although you can only access this portion of the game if you're an Xbox Live Gold member. Me? I simply have this channel, because it has a wider audience, sorry if I sound like I'm bragging, and I want to pay my respects to Formula 1 liveries from the past. I wanted to wait until I got a few hours into the career mode, so I had enough money to own custom cars that could be used for R3, R2 class events, which would increase my chances of driving these for long periods of time. Because in Forza Motorsport 3, you can upgrade road cars to be race modified. If you saw my Forza Motorsport 2 review, you might remember that custom BMW N3 tuned to the max, but it was impossible to put it in the racing class category, which I found disappointing. Well, in Forza Motorsport 3, 
you can. And if you want to save time, you can quick upgrade them. And the game automatically determines the best parts to maximize the stats based on what class you tailor it to. Because remember that certain events have restrictions. So you can technically win a race full of supercars with a Ford Fiesta. It's almost something out of Gran Turismo on the PS1. The leveling system in this game has also been altered so you don't have to reach a certain level to unlock the ability to enter higher ranked events or buy more exciting cars. Instead, you win a prize car every time you level up, and the car leveling system is used to provide discounts for the model you're currently driving. However, the maximum level you can reach here is 5, which must be a way to encourage you to drive different cars in this game. With this clean presentation, always starting at the back of the grid, you'd think the series was taking more of a Gran Turismo route. Nope, it's Forza Motorsport, though it has motivated me to drive more cleanly. The driving mechanics are as you'd expect. Based on the settings I used in this playthrough, there's a difference when you brake later and understeer and braking a bit earlier. Even the wheels can get caught in the apex. That's how detailed both car and track are. I don't know how the developers could have made it more realistic, but they did. I remember when Dan talked about how important tire physics were in a sim racer, and he quote, took it to a new level for Forza Motorsport 3. He clearly wasn't kidding. As I previously mentioned, the interior view makes it harder to avoid contact with other vehicles. Even though it requires more effort for the human body to move your head than the fingers on a controller, it's easier to do the former when driving a car, because it's more of a force of habit, and you're not driving as fast most of the time. At least EA I recognize you. In fact, if you guide them into making a mistake, that's exactly what they'll do. And how often they react depends on the difficulty, which is also something the developers wanted to implement in the gameplay. If you decide to drive like you're playing Destruction Derby, however, again, note that you can damage your car depending on your difficulty settings. But even then, cars can roll as well. But don't worry, because you can turn back the clock like a Codemasters racer as if nothing happened. How do I feel about this feature? Well, okay, I know they would eventually do this in the future, but I would have altered the difficulty settings so that the rewind system is turned off permanently, because all it does is make you invincible, because you can use it as much as you want. Like the predecessors, you can change the difficulty by configuring with the assists like steering, braking, traction control, racing line, AI, etc. And these affect race earnings. I think they made it easier, not just because you unlock the cars you want to drive sooner than later, but I basically had it set almost exactly like the predecessors, only my bonus is higher, but I'm not complaining. How you set it is entirely up to you. But my advice is, at the bare minimum, turn off the steering and brake assistance. You didn't have them in the predecessors and all you're doing is holding the acceleration down the whole time. It's boring and you don't get a feeling of accomplishment playing it this way, but that's just my opinion. Then again, you start right at the back of the grid every single time no matter how fast your car is, and you'd be considered a driving god if you can start from there and win in just a few laps day in, day out. So that's why taking liberties control-wise or the way you drive can also be forgivable. It probably explains why there are only 8 cars on the track. With motorsport, it's about practicing how fast to go around a corner, so you need to spend as much time as possible practicing before a race. In a video game, a player might not have the patience and races mostly go for a few laps. So the racing line is a good idea for beginners to help learn the tracks while progressing through the career mode. The developers said from the start that the biggest appeal of Forza Motorsport is car collecting, so don't just take my word for it. I think that's where the series has a slight advantage over Gran Turismo. The basic controls make it very easy to get the hang of it first, and as you improve if you change the driving aid settings to make it more simulation based, you'll be rewarded for it. Who needs license tests when you can do that?
these Forza games during the 2000s. I can't believe I missed out on them for so long, but that's what happens when you can only afford one console, and have friends who aren't as interested in sim racing games as I am. This is a case of better late than never, because Forza Motorsport 3 is one of the best racing games of the 7th generation, although I haven't played the 4th one as of this video, and I've been getting a lot of requests to review it even before this one, so it must be better. The real question with Forza Motorsport 3 is whether it would have been worth buying if you already had Forza Motorsport 2. It's not that easy to make racing sequels because you don't want to fall into the risk of becoming stale. What you get here is everything good about the first two games, with additional content, more accurate physics, and every car is customizable. Yeah, I say it is worth buying, especially now that it's cheaper. And I thank you ladies and gentlemen for the request, because this is the one that really motivates me to review the rest of the series. Even if I only had the one disc installed, I'm still chuffed at bits.